We were all saddened when we heard this morning of the passing of Dr. Maya Angelou, a poet, a author, an actress, a singer, and an American treasure. Angelou especially inspired little girls who loved, who recite her famous poems from the sassy and empowering phenomenal woman to the declaration of the right to live made in Still I Rise. Out of the huts of history's shame I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave, and so naturally. There I go rising. Nobody like her. Among her many devoted fans, she counted at least two U.S. presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who awarded Angelou the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House in 2011. Harriet Cole is an author, editor, and leadership co coach, and she joins us here in our Rise America studio, as well as Pearl Cleage, who is the author of Things I Should Have Told My Daughter, and she joins us by phone from Los Angeles, California. Welcome to both of you to Arise America. Well, oh, thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Oh, I know, I know both of you uh, know Dr. Angelou, and I call her that in honor of what her desire was. Of she course. liked to be called Dr. Uh, Angelou. You knew her personally, had in interactions with her. Harriet, you're sitting right here with me. Uh, is there, as you heard the news of her passing, was there a prevailing memory that struck you right away? There was. Um, when I worked at Essence Magazine for many years, in fact, I moved to New York to work there, and in 1992, I had the great honor of producing a cover shoot with her. And, you know, we produced lots of shoots of many celebrities, but walking into the room to be with her, you felt like you were walking into the space of royalty. I mean, she was, she mm -hmm. is our royalty. And not just, you know, this is Essence, African-American women at the height of Essence magazine, but she was bigger than black women. She was bigger than anything. And being in her company, we all stood a little taller. We all felt a little bit more complete because she was one who chose to use her voice and her life to honor everyone, especially black women, and to make sure that we felt proud, you know, phenomenal woman, to make sure that we knew how incredibly we were both grounded and free. And so I remembered that moment and was able to find pictures of that moment that uh, Dwight Carter shot of her and, you know, just, just to feel honored to have been able to be in her company on that time and many others. There was such a regalness to her presence. When she walked in the room, she really commanded it in a special way. Pearl, let me turn to you. You're a phenomenal writer. And I just read the, a quote of her. She said, easy reading is damn hard writing. Uh, how did she influence you as a writer? Well, I think that her example to us as black women writers was so wonderful because her writing was so beautifully done and so simple that you would feel like she was just talking to you across the kitchen table. I think that for many of us, reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings was a, a transformative experience for us as writers because she was able to talk about all of the difficulties and challenges of her life, but never from a point of view of being victimized by those challenges never from the point of view of being beaten down by those challenges. Her life was always celebratory. She always emerged as a person who was not going to be made to be less than who she was. And I think that for many of us, that um, was a very freeing kind of experience because it gave us permission to write about everything, to write about all the good stuff, to write about all the bad stuff, and to be very clear about the fact that it was our intention to rise above all of that and to be the women that we were born to be. In, indeed, and you know, she was a brilliant writer, but she was so multifaceted. I mean, she sang, she wrote, exactly. she acted. She uh, danced. She, she danced, mean, she cooked. She was in Alvin Ailey. She, I mean, she, she was what we call a Renaissance woman. But as you were saying about her writing, 
for anybody who's tried to write poetry, it's one of the most difficult things to do. <laughs> Prose is hard enough, but she took the time to process. And you know, if you remember her story, she didn't speak for almost six years because mm -hmm. she thought that her words killed her assailant. And when she chose to speak, she chose to, to lift us up, to use her words for the enlightenment of all. She could have made any kind of choice, but these 86 years that she lived on a planet will live on forever because she took the time to process her thinking and put it into words that we can hold on to and digest for generations to come. Yeah, Pearl, you know, we, we know, we being regular folk, uh, know Maya Angelou as, you know, a poet laureate and as Oprah Winfrey's friend, but what kind of person was she? She was the warmest, friendliest, most open-hearted person you can imagine. I met her, actually, for the first time at a, at a party, a house party, in the home of a friend of ours, Dr. Richard Long, who taught at Atlanta University for many years. And he had um, a party for her when she came to Atlanta, and I had admired her, but I had never met her. So when I realized she was going to be there, I was so excited to meet her, but absolutely intimidated by the prospect. And I was kind of hanging around the edges of the party trying to be in contact but not force myself into anything. And at a certain point, our friend Dr. Long came up to me and said, Maya would like to see you in the kitchen. <laughs> and it was such a, a kind of summoning that I instantly you know, went to the kitchen to see what she wanted to say to me. And she was in there rattling pots and pans. She was a wonderful, wonderful cook. So she was putting together um, the final touches on a dish she was making. And she greeted me like we had known each other for years. She knew that I was a writer. She was familiar with my work, she was very encouraging to me as a younger writer to go on um, with the path that I had chosen to continue to work. But she never put herself forward as someone who was above the rest of us, as someone who was there only to deign to give advice or, or anything like that. She was always speaking writer to writer as one woman who was trying to tell a story to other women who were trying to tell a story. And it created a space for us, I think, as the African-American women writers who were blessed to be in her presence, it created a space where we could talk honestly to her, writer to writer, about our work, about her work, about process, about what was hard, about what was easy. And I think that her ability to do that, to make you feel like you could talk to her over the kitchen table, was a great gift that she gave to those of us who had those opportunities to do that. You know, I want to get the perspective uh, from both you and Harry, but I'm going to start with you, Pearl. You know, we relate to her, or I relate to her so much as an African-American woman. I read her book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, when I was a young woman, and it influenced me in so many ways. But what's her impact uh, on the world at large? I think her impact is tremendous, and I think that sometimes we are so um, loving toward her and so much wanting to claim her for our African-American female sisterhood that we are reluctant to also um, put forward the fact that she was, if anyone ever was, a citizen of the world. Maya was comfortable any place she set herself down. She was comfortable there. And I think that people who encountered her all over the world, in South Africa, in Paris, wherever she was, felt that same kind of warmth and openness so that while she certainly is beloved um, by those of us who are also African-American women. She is a great American writer. She is in the American canon as someone who deserves to be considered and thought about and studied along with any other great American writer. And I think people around the world really feel that, as well as people in this country, that we, we feel not only her gift, but also the, the loss of her presence. Um, on this planet. Absolutely. Well, we're joined in this conversation by George Faison, who is the artistic director of the Faison Firehouse Theater. Knew Dr. Maya Angelou personally, had holiday meals with her. Yes. I'm glad you made it in. You were, you were <laughs> rushing trying to get in. We just really, literally, only have a minute or so left in this show. But what was it like to have a meal with Maya Angelou? Oh, meals. Meals, <laughs> vacation, parties, anniversaries, Maya threw. Uh, Maya was, um, Oprah threw parties for Maya. There were uh, cruises, uh, unbelievable things, and we did all sorts of I imagine the conversation at the table had to be titillating. Absolutely, because you, you know, you could be sitting by a brain surgeon or a nuclear physicist, as well as the artist and the dancer and the singer and all of those, those people, and then she could uh, throw down in the kitchen as well. So she <laughs> cooked a mean, suffocated chicken. Mm. But, it, but what she left us 
was the love that we should have for one another. She would always preach, and we would say preach, um, that no matter how you came to the table, you could be rich or poor, black or white, pretty or plain, gay or straight, any of those things. Maya embraced all those people and all of those ideas. You know, I actually have a memory of Dr. Angelou. She came and she spoke at the university when I was in veterinary school. And that presentation changed my life. I'll never forget. She came from the back of the gymnasium all the way through the crowd singing. Mm. followed by African drums. And then mm. she got up there and her words literally changed my life. I became a motivational speaker and I would channel I like Maya in my school. head. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That changed. Yeah, but she just, she was such a powerful presence. So I want to end here, uh, Harriet. She has so many quotes that we all know. One of them is, uh, you know, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Very quickly, what does she say that you'll never forget? I love that one, but just the sense of phenomenal woman, that she taught us to love ourselves and to stand strong, to stand up to the sky. Yeah, she was wonderful. And, and be fully us. We're out of time. George Fazan, mm -hmm. Harriet Cole, Carl Cleese, thank you to all. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.